Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Vijay Samuel. Uh, I am a principal architect at uh, eBay, and uh, I help build the uh, observability platform. Um, you might notice that my co-speaker is missing. Uh, Aishwarya just had her baby boy, and uh, she's back in the US right now. But uh, yes. Congratulations, Aishwarya. Uh, I, we did manage to get a recording of her portion of the talk, uh, which I'll play when, uh, when those slides come. Uh, we've been uh, using Open Telemetry Collector, and in the past, we have talked about uh, metrics in previous KubeCons. Uh, this time, we're going to talk about tracing, um, how we have been playing around with various uh, configurations of the Open Telemetry Collector, uh, and uh, where we are at right now. Uh, so various configurations and the conclusions that we were able to make while fine-tuning Open Telemetry Collector for tracing. That said, uh, uh, we'll do an introduction of what tracing is, uh, how uh, it looks like inside of eBay, uh, what's the problem we faced, uh, how we solved it, some of the lessons that we learned along the way, and uh, if time permits, uh, let's do some questions. So what is, what is tracing? Uh, Open Telemetry, the, the website, defines tracing as uh, traces give us the big picture of what happens when a request is made to an application, whether your application is a monolith with a single database or a sophisticated mesh of services, traces are essential to understanding the full path a request takes in your application. Um, so why is it important inside of eBay? We have um, call chains that can have like tens of databases, uh, several microservices to the point where knowing what exactly the customer saw when uh, a request was being served, uh, tracing is very critical for that. What is our scale? We have a 14-day retention um, with uh, 190 billion spans that we process every day, uh, which roughly translates to 2.2 million per second, uh, which is served by 3.6K uh, provision computes and uh, 150 terabytes in uh, uh, storage. And from an architecture perspective, uh, every Kubernetes cluster has three kinds of applications that run. Uh, some of them are what we like to call generic applications. Um, so these are typically, I wrote a program in an arbitrary language. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, uh, I just deploy it on Kubernetes. Um, it, uh, it's basically free flow. Uh, on the other hand, we have managed uh, applications that are there. Uh, managed meaning they have full support in terms of uh, developer lifecycle and whatnot, uh, and they have uh, SDKs into which we bundle the open telemetry SDK. So uh, generic applications would need to bundle it themselves. They need to hand roll instrumentation, whereas managed, uh, the instrumentation comes for free. They write their uh, spans into open telemetry collectors, and from there we have an ingest uh, layer which receives in uh, OTLP, uh, writes it into our trace store, um, and whatever metrics that we are generating out of the spans, it goes into our metrics platform. Um, and we have the Sherlock IO console. Sherlock IO is what we call our observability platform inside of eBay. Um, there is a trace querier, uh, which uses the Jaeger protocol, uh, and a metrics querier, which uses the, uh, um, the PromQL semantics. What is the problem that we faced? Let's be honest. Tracing is, uh, is not, it's not easy. It's, it's quite hard. Uh, tracing can become very expensive depending on the amount of HTTP requests that you're serving on a day-to-day -day basis. Organic growth means that you're going to spend a lot more. Uh, every span has uh, an arbitrary number of uh, span metadata attributes that are going to be there. There are span events. People can abuse it f like a logger. Uh, people want 100% sampling. Uh, like to give a to give a, a analogy, we have a, an internal um, logging platform which is very similar to tracing, uh, which generates 15 petabytes a day uh, with 100% samples, and this is without any of the span metadata uh, type overhead that uh, we have with the more modern version of tracing that we are using. There's a high barrier of entry for end, end users. Uh, every app needs to be. Uh, uh, instrumented in the call chain, and context propagation needs to be done right. Um, if not, you're not going to see the complete structure, which means that if there was one collector that dropped one span, 
it can it can uh, it can lead you uh, through a wild goose chase if you land on that exact span or uh, that exact trace open tel telemetry is not that easy either uh, especially with the collector there is a very famous lego analogy that's there there are many building blocks to the collector in terms of receivers processors exporters you can put them together in any order it doesn't really uh, limit you uh, so you can either create something that's really beautiful or you can create a monstrosity so you and you have the ability to have one tier of collectors two tier n tier where should the kubernetes enrichment uh, in which state should it be there are so many things that um, are left to the uh, implementer and uh, the the there are challenges adopting as well in the sense that uh, tracing is relatively new there are many people who have talked about their reference implementations yet unlike things like metrics where there are so many reference implementations out there uh, the and the community is also extremely vibrant uh, in the in the sense that what what is knowledge today can be completely obsolete tomorrow because uh, this is one of the faster moving communities out there what are the things that we uh, tried but never stuck so first we tried a single tier approach where we have all our applications writing to the open telemetry collector uh, we per first put it through the kets enrichment then we generate span metrics we do uh, the tail sampling processor and from there uh, we write the traces into the trace platform and the uh, the span metrics into the metrics platform the next approach that we tried is a two tier approach uh, where we moved the tail sampler out alone because uh, what we what we saw with the tail sampler is that all the spans for a given trace id uh, always need to land on the same uh, same open telemetry collector for it to be able to hold it in memory make the decision to sample or not sample and then flush it out so that being said we have applications that uh, right to the first year of open telemetry collector where we were doing uh, span metrics and uh, kubernetes enrichment span metrics go into the metric store uh, and uh, the raw trace goes directly in, into the trace store but we also write a copy of that into the second tier where you do the tail sampling and then you ship it into the trace store finally finally we also tried another where we moved the span metrics processor also into its own tier so on the first tier we just have the kubernetes enrichment that's there um we on the second tier there there is a there's a path dedicated for metrics that are coming from the span metric processor there's a dedicated path for tail sampling for the traces and the raw traces get written into the trace store as well so how did we go about solving this uh there are multiple things that we did the first one being we solved for mass adoption we did uh, pipeline performance tuning um we did some scaling uh, related uh, tweaks um we optimized on storage and then we went for sampling um so the next few slides we're going to talk about each one of them mass adoption the the first thing we did was we wanted to go for the highest common denominator uh during the architecture i described our managed framework 90% of all the applications that are deployed inside of ebay uh, use uh, the managed framework uh, which means that we can uh, ship instrumentation through the managed framework uh, and immediately you get 90% adoption of tracing inside the company and we have this concept of a monthly mandatory sitewide upgrade where every application that's on the managed framework automatically gets upgraded to the most recent versions of their dependencies which means that any instrumentation updates that we want to do uh, there is a one month uh, turnaround time to get it into all the applications and this around 8000 applications that we are that we are talking about um, we we are working on getting uh, uh, tracing support on our service mesh we deploy istio internally which means that if the mesh also uh, emits spans any application that does not have uh tracing uh instrumentation on it the bare minimum you would at least be able to get the client and server uh, side spans through the envoy side car uh and finally we wanted to make tracing instrumentation optional um 
so end of the day, if no developer knew how to instrument spans inside the company, um, at least I would consider that to be a win. Uh, developers, what they would need to do is just use, in case of Java, just use the SLF4j, do logger.log. .log. Under the hood, the open telemetry SDK would make sure that uh, trace IDs and span IDs are being tagged to each of these uh, log lines, and they should just be uh, able to use uh, those to get the, get the logs. They don't necessarily need to instrument spans um, uh, because the framework is already taking care of that. So within the managed framework, um, what we uh, did is that we, we shipped in the open uh, telemetry SDK, and we made sure that there is uh, instrumentation for all the client calls, all the uh, so, so, so server APIs that are there. For database calls, like uh, depending on the database, some of them have instrumentation already. We are working with the database providers internally to make sure that the remainder is covered. And we have instrumentation for iOS as well, Android coming, coming in the future. Uh, we head sample at 2% by default. Uh, and well, basically what this allows us is that um, we can do what is the click, three-click uh, three RCA, asterisk on the uh, uh, three-click because it's a little more, but the idea is for a person to be able to do an alert to metric to trace uh, and then decide if they want to go to log or profile uh, later. And exemplars play a big role on, uh, in all of this. Uh, and for all of this, we make sure that the red metrics are computed for, for uh, uh, every kind of span that's there. The, the next part is pipeline performance tuning. Um, uh, with performance numbers are, are everything. Uh, we broke down the pipeline into uh, independent chunks. Uh, we evaluated how the numbers look like, tried different combinations, rinse and repeat to the point where we can uh, figure out how to place these Legos in a way that, that, that works for us. So that being said, the first thing that we did, uh, OTLP in, OTLP out, um, memory limiter and batch, uh, which we require anyways, identify how much uh, uh, throughput we were able to get out of that. The memory limiter and batch uh, processors are very low overhead as is. Um, require some memory, uh, but not, uh, not too much. Uh, and they more or less don't impact your, your throughput. The next thing, we tried adding the span matrix processor uh, to see uh, how the throughput looks like. Um, it's, 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 it's fine for a single instance. Um, but for uh, multiple instances, we'll, we'll get to it in a couple of slides. The, the next one is basically the, the Kubernetes uh, uh, metadata enrichment. This is an interesting one. On, on a single instance, we saw that pulling the entire cluster's worth of pod metadata along with some namespace metadata uh, had, a, had a 5GB overhead. Uh, but when we add multiple inst instances, even though uh, we were shedding the uh, the number of spans evenly across various instances, the overhead of each Kubernetes uh, 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 enrichment processor remains the same because every instance has to anticipate every pod's uh, data that's uh, span, spans that are coming in. Uh, so it has to hold all the uh, span, uh, pro pod metadata in memory. So across each one of them, you basically see a standard memory overhead that's there. Uh, so the final configuration that we, that we ended up with, um, the first stage only does the uh, Kubernetes enrichment. Uh, it does an OTLP exporter into the second tier, where we only do uh, uh, span, met, uh, span metric processing. We completely dropped the idea of uh, doing the tail sampling, uh, because the way we see traffic inside the company, it doesn't really make sense to do tail sampling on the uh, open telemetry collector. Uh, and the simple reason being that there is always going to be the case where a request flows from one region to another, uh, which would mean that we would have to load balance all span traffic across regions to make sure that the entire request spans uh, are being processed by a single uh, open telemetry collector. And this was um, simply not feasible for us. And depending on the kind of application, you would have to hold the span, uh, spans for a longer window uh, which means that you need more memory. So we went for an entirely different uh, uh, tail sampling uh, methodology, which Aishwarya will, will talk about. Uh, and or even on the load balancing exporter, uh, Aishwarya helped uh, add a feature 
to load balance based on uh, service name instead of trace ID. Because if you were doing the uh, service name, uh, so, sorry, the trace ID based uh, load balancing, what's, be, what's going to happen is that every pod in the second tier will need to uh, see every kind of uh, span metadata combination. But, uh, but on the other hand, if you do just by service name, all meta metadata combinations for a single service is always going to be co-located on a single collector, which means that the memory requirements are substantially reduced. It's like everyone needs to know everything versus a collector needs to know about only a given service. So um, that change on the open telemetry collector also made things uh, quite efficient. So if you are doing a two-tier approach where the second tier is going to do span metrics, it's better to do the service name based uh, uh, load balancing rather than the trace ID based uh, load balancing. On, on scaling, we did uh, two things. Uh, the first thing is uh, we started leveraging KEDA uh, because, uh, like I said, uh, logging and tracing have very seasonal uh, uh, throughput. Uh, throughput. Um, um, it's a, so uh, at least for us during the holiday period or during weekends, when there is more shopping that's happening, you're going to see more volume, which means that uh, doing uh, auto scaling can, can greatly uh, improve our ability to handle higher traffic without having sustained uh, uh, deployments of uh, large size installations all the time. And the second, second, one, uh, second thing that we did is to make sure that uh, we are not using the Kubernetes uh, service object to do the load balancing, because the weighted round robin approach that it uses um, uh, for uh, gRPC requests, it is not very efficient and ends up uh, sending the open telemetry collector pods out of memory. Um, so uh, we basically use uh, the mesh uh, which can handle gRPC uh, load balancing a lot better for that. With regards to storage, um, from a consumption perspective, we uh, implement the Jaeger APIs, um, um, because that's more or less a standard right now. And we use uh, ClickHouse for, uh, for storage. Uh, ClickHouse is cheap, it's fast, uh, it, really, it, it works really well for us. But the one improvisation that we do is that we don't have a single large ClickHouse cluster but we have smaller ClickHouse clusters that are backed by a ring-based discovery. There's a, there's a routing table that we maintain saying that this service name needs to be routed into this particular Kubernetes cluster, and uh, our ingest APIs, they can basically use that to make decisions on where to write the uh, data into. And we also make sure that you don't need to do a global scatter gather on all the queries by implementing a global index. So every trace ID, um, um, we know exactly which are the shards on, on each of the clusters uh, to basically query to get the data back rather than trying to query all of them. This is how our uh, uh, storage architect uh, architecture looks like. Um, we have a traces table, which has the standard uh, 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 parameters that a given uh, uh, span uh, requires. We supplement that with a bunch of materialized views, uh, one for service operation, uh, which has the service name and operation name. We have the trace ID and service name in another materialized view, and we have an index saying that this is the index ID for this service name plus uh, resource attribute uh, combination. And this is basically what, uh, a combination of all three is what we basically use uh, uh, to make routing decisions. And we also have a sampled, uh, 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 a trace sample table where all the sample traces which are retained longer are stored. Uh, both these uh, tables and materialized views have different retention. We, re we retain the raw traces for two hours uh, because we believe that um, a usual site triaging event should not require more than two hours worth of uh, uh, spans. And the sample table is what we retain for uh, 14 days after, after the two hours has expired. Um, let me move to Aishwarya's. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Aishwarya. I'm working as a senior software engineer for Absorbility Platform at eBay, and I've been working on the tracing project. Now, coming to the sampling part of tracing, we have a lot of applications at eBay that send traces and there's a huge amount of data to process and store on the tracing platform. 
So with that, we are faced with two fundamental questions. Is every trace really useful? If not, do we really have a room to be more efficient while processing and storing data on the tracing platform? Now moving on to the next slide, um, if you see this diagram, uh, this shows the high level representation of how tracing data looks like. So we have a lot of traces that ended up without any issues and we have a small set of traces that ended up with high latency and also a small set of traces that ended up with errors. So we don't really need to store all this data on the platform. So to be more efficient and effective, so um, the ideal representative sample would be to sample a small percentage of traces that ended up without any issues. And we can always sample 100% of, uh, we can always sam sample 100% of traces that ended up with high latency and also, um, and also with errors. If we are really interested, then we can also take samples of traces with specific attributes that we are really interested in. So uh, with that, we can be more efficient on, this, on, on, on the platform side. Now moving on to the next slide. Um, yeah, we have, uh, uh, we, have, we, we have adapted two types of sampling mechanisms. So the first one is SDK-based parent uh, head sampling. Uh, so we have, uh, 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 so we, uh, so when applications generate traces, so even before sending those traces to the platform, they are sampled at 2% uh, by default by the framework. So the type of sampling that we are using here is parent tracer based. So that means when a root level generates a trace ID, uh, root, root service decides whether to sample a, a, a trace ID or not. So when the decision is made, the decision is passed on to all the services in the call chain and all those services obey the decision sent by the parent whether to sample a trace ID or not. So um, uh, with that, we also generate exemplars. So exemplars generate trace IDs that are only sampled. So basically, uh, uh, we attach these exemplars to a latency metric that is present on all the applications. So this latency metric um, has a dimension, uh, uh, has a latency dimension bucket, and we add exemplars to each dimension bucket. So when there is any issue, it's real, it's uh, it's easy to debug because we have at least one exemplar present, and we can easily jump from uh, metrics to traces to see the end-to-end -end distribution, uh, to see end-to-end -end call chain, and see where where the issue really exists. Going on to the next slide. So the next step, a sampling technique that we adapted is exemplar based tail sampling. So when we receive traces sent by, uh, sent by applications, we store all the raw traces for two hours and then we apply exemplar based tail sampling. Uh, so basically, as I already told, we record exemplars for uh, metrics on the framework. Uh, when 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 a trace ID is recorded as an exemplar, that means it's it's really important and has to be preserved for longer duration of time. So all those uh, trace IDs recorded as exemplars are received, um, and then they they are they are sampled and stored for longer duration of time. So not only exemplars uh, exposed by uh, framework, we also have uh, we also have span matrix processor running. And all the traces that are received on um, um, at, at rece received on the platform um, uh, use span matrix connector to compute red matrix, meaning request error and duration. And we also have exemplars attached to each and every red matrix. So uh, recently, we also added a new metric called events total, um, which uh, which record um, which which record metrics for error labels that are emitted as part of spans. Uh, and since we have exemplars recorded for all these metrics, uh, so we, we collect all the trace IDs uh, from, from, from these exemplars and they are also stored for longer duration of time. Now, apart from these two, um, these two um, uh, sampling techniques, we also have 1% uh, of random sampling across all the traces that are received on the platform. Now, moving on to the next slide. So uh, coming to the tail sampling architecture that we follow, so we have trace, uh, tracing hotel collectors and framework sends all the spans to the tracing hotel collectors. And we also have span metric processor running that generates uh, red metrics. And these metrics are sent to our metrics ingest pipeline. And this metrics ingest pipeline also send these metrics to metric aggregator. So metric aggregator during rollup, it also preserves exemplars and they are not dropped, um, are not dropped in the pipeline. So once aggregator receives uh, all the metrics and uh, aggregations are done, 
So these metrics are again sent back to the tail sampler ingest that we have. So these, this tail sampler ingest collects all the exemplars and it, it records all the trace IDs and stores in, in our ClickHouse table. So we also have a tail sampler job that is running. So tail sampler jobs pick, uh, tail sampler job picks the trace IDs that are needed to be sampled and it gets all the trace IDs and it gets the tracing data from raw tables and, 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 and samples all the traces that are being exposed as an exemplar. Uh, so, a uh, couple of more things on that, uh, on the section that Aishwarya uh, talked about. So, exemplars are really imp important to us uh, in the sense that um, think of latency metrics that are there. You basically decide uh, if you're not using the new native histograms, histograms, you basically decide what are the buckets that uh, you're defining for your latency. And each one of them is going to sample. Um, uh, exemplars and then emit it into your backend, which basically means that if you take those exemplars and you keep uh, sampling all of those trace IDs uh, uh, to retain longer, what you're essentially going to get is that for every uh, bucket that you defined, you get sample traces for every host that's emitting uh, these metrics, which means that when you sample, it's true. It's almost a, a, a representative sample for your entire uh, uh, ecosystem. And what Aishwarya did also is that she worked with the uh, open telemetry commu community to make sure that uh, uh, we are emitting uh, events total as a metric, where if you record every event that has a unique exception type, uh, that also means that okay, every er error scenario also you are making sure for every host every error type, you have at least one sample that you're retaining uh, much longer. This greatly improves uh, our, our efficiency while at the same time not impairing the customer experience uh, too much. So what did we get out of all, of all of this? One, we got a cheaper and easier platform to operate, not having to retain all these spans for a greater window, not having to do complex uh, sampling algorithms uh, on the open telemetry collector or even after the fact uh, when it has landed on storage. Uh, now that we have uh, distributed tracing without any of the developers having to lift a finger, we can create uh, uh, dependency graphs at both a per request level or at the uh, service to service level. And we have an industry standard uh, in terms of open telemetry, but at the same time, we are gearing it uh, heavily towards what eBay actually needs. What are the lessons that we learned? The first thing is observability is a team sport, uh, and we should use all the pillars effectively and not try to say that, okay, use this one pillar and try to derive everything out of that. Um, in our case, you saw how closely knit the metrics platform and the trace platform are uh, uh, are being knit together because uh, the metrics now provide the signal on what needs to be sampled and what does not. Um, and at the same time, all our uh, P1 observability or P1 detection functions are, are strictly uh, done just by metrics. We don't try to use the other ones. Uh, exemplars could offer a representative sample. Uh, we just uh, uh, talked about that. Uh, numbers really matter. Uh, Fine-tuning took a lot of uh, benchmarking, profiling, uh, and we finally were able to land uh, at a pattern that was good. Uh, sometimes the community also offers some prescribed patterns. It's better to just stick to them rather than trying to improvise. And finally, no one should need 100% uh, sampling to do effective observability. At our scale, uh, we do 2% uh, sampling, which is plenty enough for us to be able to uh, look at uh, all kinds of issues, uh, because end of the day, one in 50 requests need to have the issue that uh, the customer is facing. Um, and with the kind of call volumes that we have in a day, uh, one in 50 is fairly easy to achieve. Um, with that, um, I'll take questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Very great talk. Um, very familiar themes and very familiar journey in that. In that. Maybe for other people, I'll be interested. Um, I've got some questions. What, first, um, the, your deployment model for the collector, it, seem, it sounds like you didn't uh, specify, but it sounds like you have a central pool of replicas for your, Correct. your, your gateway, and you haven't got like sidecars or no. uh, agent per host or per Kubernetes node. Correct. Correct. Yeah, and the reason that we do that is that um, the there is a there is a severe problem of resource fragmentation when we go down the route of either a, a daemon set or a sidecar. Sidecar, you also have the problem that if we if we need to do upgrades, uh, then we'll have to restart the parent container, or we'll have to have the managed platform do a rollout across the site, uh, which is more than 8,000 applications, like I mentioned. So the, the, the cluster local gives us the flexibility to do independently rollout. We can have bigger pods uh, for handling more, uh, 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 more throughput, and we can scale it uh, at will. So that's why we do that. Okay. Um, also, the, you, you didn't uh, mention application metrics. So you, you mentioned span metrics, but you're not collecting metrics with your collectors or logs either? Uh, so logs, we do the file-based uh, approach. It still uses the daemon set pattern. Um, we are slowly but surely, uh, now that the logs API is stable, uh, trying to get uh, people to adopt uh, the SLF4J-based bridge for open telemetry. Sometime this year, that should uh, happen. For metrics, um, there is some free instrumentation similar to tracing where the four golden signals are instrumented on a dedicated Prometheus endpoint, and we scrape it for free for all the applications that use uh, Manage Stack. And there also we emit exemplars for the um, uh, latency metric as well. Uh, there are actually, uh, since we ha the managed framework has a lot of framework providers as well, like uh, the database team or the messaging team and whatnot, and each one of them have their independent uh, Prometheus endpoint, which we scrape and then we ship it into, into our metrics platform. Uh, and a lot of uh, free observability is provided to them in terms of say, curated dashboards, curated alerts, being able to do health aware rollouts and things like that. Okay. One more very quick one on your ingest. Do you hmm. have any buffering or asynchronous um, read-write buffering and storage before storage? Uh, we only do the batch uh, batch processor. Nothing nothing more than that. So everything is pushed straight through the pipeline to your storage. Oh, yeah. If you, if the question is, are we using something like Kafka? Uh, no, we we do not. Uh, we just uh, uh, receive it on the gateway. We pick a pick a click a shard to write, and that shard will also have a buffer table. We push into that, and then it periodically flushes into storage. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Vijay. It was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, my question is on the uh, application level sampling that you did. Hmm. Uh, can you talk a bit about that, Miss? Uh, how did you decide what to uh, filter out? Because my my I'm coming from a point where you might be filtering out something which is a uh, high latency trace. Uh, so on the application, as in the SDK-based sampling, yes. we, we just do head sampling, uh, like uh, probabilistic sampling at uh, 2%. Um, so basically, it's as good as flipping a coin and deciding if something needs to be sampled uh, or not. And we are OK to do that because when we look at all our latency patterns or the number of errors that are being seen at a, on a given application, it's well over. 50 per per host, which which generally means that like a two percent sample, um, the lowest volumes should still see at least one uh, request that's coming coming into the uh, platform. So that being said, like uh, we just go go the go down that route. Uh, one follow up last from my side. So uh, how did you? Uh Miss, what made you decide to have a trace store as ClickHouse uh, versus directly using a load balancer and then doing the tail sampling, passing on to collector? Uh, the, the logic was the one that I mentioned earlier uh, in the sense that we have cross-region traffic, uh, which, ne which necessarily means that like, if you want to do a proper tail sampling on the collector, all the traffic that was seen across regions needs to come into the same trace collector. And we try to make sure that we are not passing um, 
a log or a trace information across regions unless we really have to. Uh, and that being, uh, and the other reason being that doing a true tail sampling, you can always have a, a five minute or 10 minute offset or even a one hour offset for something that's really long for whatever reason to come in and then do the tail sampling decision. But we, uh, in the case of uh, the tail sampling processor, you at best can do maybe 20 seconds, 40 seconds, and if your throughput is really high, then you need a lot more memory to make sure that you're really doing a good job in the tail sampling. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, great talk. Um, you. Two questions about tail sampling. The first one, is it based on open telemetry or is it uh, something that you implemented yourself? Second, uh, you mentioned that it's a tail sampling job. Do you mean that it's a cron job that, how, how frequently does it run and, and could you touch a little bit on how it is implemented? Uh, so the exemplar based uh, tail sampling is something that we built in house, but uh, it is something that is reasonably easy to uh, implement on your own. Um, all you would need to do is you have a processor that can ba basically look at all the uh, the metric signals and basically write them into uh, something like a database table uh, so that whenever there is an exemplar, it's, it's making note of that. And the tail sampler, like you mentioned, is, uh, uh, is just a cron job that basically selects that table that has the trace IDs and then uses that as the subquery to basically pull all the raw spans into a different uh, table. Uh, and that window can be configured, so we do two parameters. One is the offset, after how long it needs to kick off, and uh, what is the interval. So typically we do five plus five, so at the fifth minute we make sure that the tenth minute is being um, uh, sampled. So the same query that I talked about, it just keeps getting applied for that time window. Uh, 